Hello everyone, I'm Two-Faced Teller, but you can call me V, and this is Adventures with Anxiety. This is going to be part of six games. Uh, whoever you are, stay strong and good luck. There are mental health resources on the game page, and this is made by Nikki Case. Content notes. Adventures with anxiety is about, well, anxiety, but I've made this for folks with anxiety disorder like myself. I hope it can help you see with humor how anxiety works and just maybe reduce the fear of fear itself. There's also badly drawn sick figures and a hyperactive wolf. Enjoy. Other notes. Alcohol abuse, sexuality, uh, shitload of swearing. Mm -hmm. Welcome. This is this is less of a game and more of an interactive story. Hope you like reading. Ah, <laughs> oh, man, you got me. So before we start, how would you like to read? Speak this fast or just all the way. In advance on click automatically on click. Great note, you can always change options with the icon below. Also, game autosaves at each chapter. Now let's begin our story. This is a human. And this is the human's anxiety. You are the anxiety. I am so sorry. Oh, good. My wolf's back. Fantastic. Your job is to protect your human from danger. In fact, that sandwich is putting them in danger right now. Quick, warn them. Human, listen. We're in danger. The danger is. Let your anxiety come out to play. Pick what's most similar to what your fear tells you. We're eating alone for lunch. Again. We're not productive while eating. That white bread's bad for us. We're eating alone for lunch. Again. Don't you know lonely it? loneliness is associated with premature death as much as smoking 15 cigarettes a day? Holt, Holt, Holt Lund, Lundston 2010. Something medicine. Um, thanks for citing your sources, but... Which means if we don't hang out with someone right now, we're gonna die! You use fear of being unloved. It's super effective. See, human? I'm your loyal card wolf. Trust your gut. Your feelings are always valid. Get your human's energy bar to zero. To protect your physical, social, moral, moral needs, you can use fear of being harmed, fear of being unloved, and fear of being a bad person. Pro tip, play the choices that personally hit your deepest, darkest fears. You know, you know what? Maybe it's time to check my phone. Protect your human from the world, from other people, from themselves. Good luck. Round one, fight. Facebook feed says there's a party happening this weekend. Doesn't that weird that they're a party every weekend? What inner void are they fill trying to fill? They must be deeply messed up inside. Also, I got an invite. Well then. Say yes, or we'll die from loneliness. Say no, it's full of poisonous drugs. Ignore, ignore it. We just make parties sad. Hmm, it's between this one and this one. Well, I mean, I'm not gonna do it, so... Ignore it. We just make parties sad. All we ever do is cry in a corner about how loneliness is as deadly as 15 cigarettes a day. Gee, I wonder why. So if we go, we'll make them feel bad. But if we, dr we reject their invite, we'll also make them feel bad! All we do is make people feel bad, so we should feel bad! 
Ugh. I'll make you shut up fine. I'll ignore the invite. Anyway. Facebook's too much. I need something calmer, less anxiety producing. What's new on Twitter? Oh no. Look at that horrible news story. Oh no, is that tweet secretly about us? Hey, a gif about a cat drinking milk. Uh. Oh no, is that tweet secretly about us? It's a subtweet, a sneaky, sneaky subtweet. It's probably not. But what if they're all talking behind our back? They're not in front of our back. I don't. But what if? What if? Okay, gonna try Snapchat. Huh, photos from yesterday yesterday night, so that's what those weekly parties are like. Hmm, that looks really fun. Maybe I shouldn't have ignored the invite? Keep ignoring, we're still party poopers. Actually say yes, actually say no. Uh, maybe I shouldn't have ignored it. Actually say no. It's too crowded. Crowds are dangerous. Don't you know about human stampedes? In 2003, a Rhode Island nightclub had a fire and the panic made people jam the exit so 100 people burned to death. Do you want that to happen to us? Say no, say no, say no, say no. Shut up! I'll change my answer to no, God. Whatever. New Tinder notification. What? That hookup app? It's not a hookup app, it's just a way to meet new people. It's a hookup app. Oh, I got a match. They look cute. Please don't ruin this for me. Danger, 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 danger! We're being used by other people. We're just using other people. Your match is a serial killer! They'll tear- they'll tear your flesh to gory confetti, turn your entrails into streamers, and mix your blood into a punch bowl. How's that for a party invite? I'm so sick of this game. Loneliness will kill us, they're talking behind our back, there's a serial killer. I just want to live my life. I just want to be free from all this pain. Be a human. It'll be okay. As your loyal guard wolf, I'll always keep an eye out for danger and do my best to keep you safe. I promise. Last app. Instagram. What you got? It's more party pictures. Everyone looks so happy, free from worry, free from anxiety. God, why can't I be like them? Why can't I just be normal? Speaking of parties, how about this weekend's invite? Here's my final decision. <laughs> I don't want to say no. Just go. I mean... What's the worst that could happen? You stand in the corner and do nothing? Honestly, there might be like a cat or a dog or something. I can't do it. I can't say no. It makes me feel guilty. We should... Fuck. You. Uh. Well? I'm going to say yes to that party. Not because you want me to, but because I want to. You're not in control of me. Now excuse me while I eat this delicious sandwich in goddamn peace. <laughs> We're gonna die! Everyone hates us! We're horrible people! Congratulations! You've successfully protected your humans' physical, social, and moral needs. Why, look how grateful they are! Now that their energy is zero, you can directly control their actions. Pick your ending move. Finish them. Ugh. Cry. The whole world is filled with danger. Do like the armadillo, curl up into a ball of self-defense. Curl up, cur cry, curl up, cry, curl up. That was a really weird crying animation. Yay! We destroyed a person. 
fears this round. Being harmed. 3. Being unloved. 2. Being a bad person. 1. Game autosave. It's okay to quit and continue later. So yeah, they never replied back. Hi! Even though you both match each other on Tinder? N nice party. Yeah, I don't know. What did they think? I was a serial killer or something? So paranoid. Ugh, I know, right? <coughs> Round two, fight. Oh no, they all hate us. Are you ogling the redhead? Okay, let's talk about the meaning of life. Oh god, was that us? Were they talking about us? Oh no, they hate us! We're bringing down the mood of this party by being such a sad lump. We're killing the good vibes, we're, commu we're committing first degree vibe murder! Human, we have to leave now before... Um... Can you hear me, human? <gasps> I was warning you about... More of the same danger. A different social danger. You're ignoring danger. That's dangerous. A different social danger. Actually, you know what's worse than no one liking you? Everyone liking you. That is, becoming one of these pleasure-chasing party animals. A shallow life with shallow friends who only know the shallow you. Human, we need to run away from these pleasure zombies before they turn us into one of them. Well, thank goodness, human. I think you can hear me again. I shall warn you about... Did you check that punch before drinking? I'm not being irrational. People do drug punch bulls. This is an actual thing that actually happens. Human, does your head hurt? Are your limbs limp? I think you're dying. Oh god, we're dying! <laughs> Fact! Facking, facking, fang. Yay, human! I'm so happy you can hear me again. I'm so sorry. Why were you ignoring me? Holy hell, you absolute moron! You know that Native American story? There are two wolves inside you. One is hope. One is despair. Which wolf wins? The one you feed? I was trying to starve you, you sadistic asshole. Screw it. I'll do positive affirmations instead. I am love. I am beautiful. I am smart. I am beautiful. I am special. God, that's so narcissistic. No affirmations were disproven. Oh my god, don't credit random stories to indigenous folk. Uh... I'm going with this one. <laughs> you know, affirmations were disproven. In fact, they actually backfired for people with low self-esteem. It was a well-designed study, randomized controlled trial, experimenting was blinded as to who was in which group. Results. If you already had low self-esteem, being asked to repeat affirmations make you feel worse than if you said nothing at all. Wood, 2009, Psychological Science. Look it up on Google Scholar, human. Then stop spreading unscientific fake news! Ass, ah, damn it. You know what? You're irrational. Everyone knows emotions are irrational, especially fear. You're a useless, useless evolutionary leftover like my appendix, appendix or wisdom teeth. Hell, this whole wolf metaphor is stupid. You're just a bunch of neural chemicals in my head. So why should I listen to a worthless, irrational, non-existent piece of shit like you? Wow, that that was a little hurtful, man. I'm a feeling feelings are valid. You and we're both just chemicals. I'm a part of you, you know. When you say that, you're hurting yourself. Why are you hitting yourself, human? Stop hitting yourself! I hate this. God, it hurts so much. I hate this. I can't appease you. I can't ignore you. I can't fight you. No matter what I do, I can't seem to get rid of you. Well, maybe you're not supposed to get rid of me. How do you think I feel, human? I'm trying my best to be your guard dog, but you keep seeing me as some big bad wolf. So I try even harder just to alert you to danger. More danger, different danger. 
But no matter how hard I try to protect you, you still think I'm your enemy. What am I doing wrong? I know I suck at my job, but I'm trying, human. I'm trying. You don't have to heed my warnings or agree with me or even like me. I just... All I want is for you to be patient with me. I just want for you to sit with me for a while instead of turning away and... Hey. Looks like you're caught in a fight with yourself, kid. Was it that obvious? You were, uh, mumbling at your hoodie about punch bowls or something. Oh god, I'm such a mess. Hey, you're not alone, friend. Anxiety's super common. Heck, just yesterday I heard someone curled up into an armadillo ball and cried in public. <coughs> Listen, I know what it's like to have that animal in your head. Well, we all do. That's why I throw these parties every weekend to forget our worries, forget that animal. But my anxiety... Don't worry, kid. I used to be like you, but then I found a little trick to get that negative voice to shut up forever. My own specialty blend. It's a bit stronger than, well, anything legal, really. Bottoms up, biatch! Oh my god, this is a bad coping mechanism. Don't take drinks from strangers. This... This, this is a bad coping mechanism. Mmm, what an exquisite palette. Full-bodied flavor of shut your mind up with a subtle aftertaste of never feel anything ever again. This is bad human. This is really, really bad. This is actually how addiction starts. I knew the host was deeply messed up. Also, they could have drunk that. This is how addiction starts. Delicious and cheaper than therapy. Human, please stop. <laughs> and what are you going to do about it, asshole? I'm so sorry, human. I'm going to have to use my special attack. Uh. What's this crap? You're going to yap more stupid words at me, too? How was that? I'm sorry, I needed to show you the consequences. I could see my own corpse. I could feel the sensation of being actually dead. I'm sorry, human. <laughs> I knew all these par party goers were deeply messed up. They all dull their pain with horrible things. And they're tricking you into doing the same thing. They're corrupting you. We need to get out. Get out, get out, get out, get out, get out. You alright, kid? Okay, sorry, I have to run. Damn it, the animal won today, huh? No, no, just, uh, gotta run a marathon, gotta go fast. Come to my party next weekend, cutie. I'll make something even stronger for you. Okay, thanks, gotta run, run, run! You and me, kid, we'll show the beast who's boss. Human, are you okay? Gosh, that was close. We really could have. I'm coming back to the party next weekend. The next time we fight, I'm not just going to defeat you. I'm going to fucking kill you. You. Oh, when? Being harm three, being unloved two, being a bad, bad person one. It's literally the same thing that I did last round. <coughs> Cheers! Wow, okay, the, voice, the voices in the background sound like the souls of the damned. Ah, that hits the spot. You know, kid? Specifically the spots hit are my left and right? I'm Dala. You remind me of myself when I was younger, back when I was tormented by the animal in my head. I'm so grateful I can pay it forward and help you kill the beast the same way I killed mine. Hey, quick question. Truth or da dare? <laughs> Good. Okay, you see that baby blue swimming pool down there? Yeah, six floors down. Jump in. 
Wait, what? The animal started whining, hasn't it? Oh no, it's dangerous. Don't do it. But that's exactly why we need death death defying thrills. Party hard, carpe diem, snort coke off a hooker's ass, YOLO. Show that animal we don't give two dicks about its bitching. Jump in. Uh, but sometimes, um, uh, fear has a point. I'm sorry, did you fall for that mindfulness propaganda that claims feeling bad is good? The assholes who run this world give the rest of us anxiety and depression. Then make TED Talks to tell us to accept being fucked over and embrace that sadistic demon in our heads. Kid, I know that you know that animals hurt people like us. It torches people like us. It's not our friend. It's a rabid beast which either needs to be tranquilized or have a bullet put in its skull. Otherwise, you're going to let it win. No. You're wrong. I'm not going to let it win. Fuck yeah, I believe in you, babe. Kill it. No, 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 no. This chapter has two possible endings. One is very, very bad. No, 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 no. Choose wisely, protect your human. <laughs> Good luck. Human, you could actually die here. This is stupid and self-destructive. These sickos aren't really your friends. You could- you could actually die. You know, I might have believed you if you hadn't tried that a, zil a zillion times before. You're the wolf who cried wolf. Fuck. Uh, well, now that these are gonna help... You tried that too. Human, please? Oh, I'm sorry Big Pharma doesn't approve of my self-medication. Look, asshole, we all have a way of shutting you the fuck up. Some people throw themselves into work. Some people throw themselves into sex, drugs, and refreshing their Facebook feed. Some people throw themselves into other people. I'm going to throw myself into that swimming pool. You're drunk and it's six floors down. Dang it, this is the thanks that I get? Okay, I admit it, I messed up. <laughs> oh, wow, is that the biggest fucking understatement of the century? Yeah, you rotting pile of blood-coated shit, you messed the fuck up. Any other remarks, Captain Obvious? But revenge on me is an answer, but this time I'm actually right. I've hurt you. I was so obsessed with making sure nothing else hurt you that I didn't realize I was creating the hurt. No shit! God damn, it really took you this long to finally figure it out? You could have saved us so much trouble, you big fluffy dumbass. Why didn't you realize this sooner? I'm sorry I wasn't a good protector. I'm sorry I didn't respect you. I'm sorry. I was supposed to be your loyal guard dog, but I acted as if you were supposed to obey me. There's a difference between a protector and a prison warden, and I crossed the line. I'm sorry. Yeah, well, this was a dumb idea anyway. I only did this to mess you up, and well, I messed you up. Let's just call this round a tie, okay? Okay. Okay. Tie. Oh, come on. After all that... Animals done to you, you're just giving up? What's the matter, kid? Are you scared? Yeah. I'm scared. And that's okay. It's okay to be scared. Did they just lock the door? Lake Tears. Ah, 
So, what the hell was the moral of this story? What did we even learn? I was being stupid, my friends were using me, and we almost fucking died. Yeah, not to mention the liver damage. Yeah, that was the worst case scenario. Yeah, I was right. That was the worst case scenario. Then, yet, yeah, hmm? we survived. Despite everything, we're still here. You seem pretty calm considering we just had a near, near death experience. Well, it makes everything else less scary in comparison. It's also got me thinking. If me fighting you sucks because it doesn't protect you, me, but me fighting you also sucks because it just makes you yell louder, then maybe... maybe we don't have to fight. I'm not a big bad wolf, but I'm not a guard wolf either. I'm a battered shelter dog. We've been through rough stuff. Maybe trauma or neglect, that's why I sometimes overreact and go... But I don't want to be a cowardly dog. I want to protect you. Uh, I want to be a good dog. Human, will you help tame this wolf? I... I'll try. Okay. Healthy relationship with emotions. Relationships need communication, so let's communicate. The next five minutes are going to sound super cheesy, but let's fake it till we make it. Dear inner wolf, how are you feeling? Total fears used. Harmed. Six. Unloved. Four. Bad person. Two. What fear do you want to talk about first? You can do the others later. I'm scared we'll be harmed. I want to protect your need for physical safety. But the whole world seems so dangerous, so full of tragedy and evil. I don't know enough of me. I don't know. Enough of me choosing what to say next. What do you say, human? You're right, so let's protect ourselves. Let's expose ourselves to more danger. Thank you. Thank you. Wait. No arguments for or against what I'm feeling? Just thank you? Yeah, thank you for showing your concern for my physical safety. You okay? You've never said thank you to me before? Aw, oh, you big fuzzy wuzzy panic wolf. Anyway, anything else you want to chat about? I'm scared we'll be alone. Uh, I want to make sure you fulfill that deep human need to belong, but I worry that if anyone ever knew us, the real us, we'd scare them all away. Again, back to you, human. What do you think? I agree. Let's work on our social life. I think people like us. Let's find out. Thank you. We could try some experiments. We could ping a friend to hang out, reconnect with an old pal, or even just chat with a barista. I think we may find we're more likable than we suspect. What if these are small cheap wins? What if this is a burden to others, but small talk isn't the real us? Uh... What if this is a burden to others? Maybe the person just wants to make some dang coffee, not be an experiment to see if our social skills suck. Well, if it turns out we are being a burden, that's good to know too. We can then turn how, learn how to pro proactively ask people what they're comfortable with to know and respect others' boundaries. You know all that interpersonal skills crap we see in counselor brochures, so anything else on your heavy heart? I'm scared we're bad people. I want to defend your moral needs that drive to become a better person, but it just feels like deep down we're so fundamentally broken. And don't tell me we're not messed up. We almost jumped off a roof. More thoughts, human? So we're broken. Let's accept it. I mean, that's what therapists say, right? Accept all your emotions, even the negative ones? Wait. Uh, as in a proof? Like it's good that we're broken or something? No! All those dang Hollywood screenwriters who ram romanticize mental illness are full of crud. Having a mental disorder sucks. It robs people of lives. Why should we accept that? I think therapists mean accept our emotions as in be patient with them. 
Like how struggling in quicksand makes you sink faster and the solution is to patiently lie flat. Fighting against you, my fear almost led me to jump off a roof. Instead, the solution is to do what we're doing now, not to fight, but to patiently be with each other. Then they should say that instead of some problemic word like accept. Yeah, come to think of it, accept kind of sucks. I do not accept, accept. Okay, I think we've talked about all our fears now. Yeah, there are only three fears. Yeah, exactly three. Convenient. This isn't some game, you know. Building a healthy relationship with your emotions isn't as simple as clicking buttons on a screen. Can we really get along? Can we work together as a team? Well... Excuse me. No, oh, would you mind if I sat with you for lunch? This is your crush? Why are they sitting alone like a psycho serial killer? Uh, I, I mean, it's it's okay. If not, I, I just... Didn't I see you at the party? Yeah, of course. Come here. Hang on, human. They seem uncomfortable. Uh, no pressure, of course. Just saying you can sit here if you want to. Just be careful of the lake of tears. They're being too friendly. Like Ted Bundy, serial killer. Run! Huh. That was weird. I wonder what was going on in their head. Anyway, you were saying? Uh, forget it. Something about team- I, I forget. Uh, I forget. Something about teams and work? They say you should make peace with your emotions as if your emotions are war criminals. I want us to make more than mere peace. I want us to be allies. I want to be a good guard dog, just like how hunger and thirst are alarms for your physical needs. I want to be the alarm for your f psychological needs, your needs for safety, belonging, goodness. But I suck at my job, so I need you to train me. I'm not always valid, nor always irrational. I'm just trying my best, so please help me help you. Oh, teaching an old dog new tricks will take a while, maybe years, and sometimes I'll relapse, I'll slip into my old habits, I'll bark at shadows, or I'll scare you with words. I mean, I, I might even show you some intrusive images of things. I'm sorry, I'm a battered shelter dog. Battered dogs poop on your bed sometimes. And if you're patient with me and just stay and sit with me, then maybe you can tame this bull. Good human. Oh, you're eating alone 15 cigarettes! <laughs>
dysphoria eating disorders. Eight in the morning already? Uh, why is it so loud? It's Monday, time for work, sleepyhead. Fine. Okay, first, clothes. Yeah, I'm not a nudist. Then, brush my teeth. I have an electric toothbrush. Then food. Yay, pizza. And then I need to go out the door, lock it, check it twice, and then catch the number five to work. Yep, wardrobe, bathroom, kitchen, door, check. Actually, first I need to get up from bed. Yay. And don't forget your meeting, Sarah and Mick, later today. Alright, tabletop on Monday, got it. Good luck! Do other people have conversations like this in their head? Whatever, let's, let's go. Oh. Wake up. Bathroom. Kitchen. Clothes. Do we check this before we leave? Hey, it's Mick. Looking forward to today? Yep. Awesome, up early. Guess who has an interview in 41 minutes? Good luck. Yeah, it was kind of last minute. I'll tell you about it today. I gotta run now, though. Bye! Kitty. Okay. Grab your jacket, check the mirror, and go. Or not, I guess. They're just gonna go. Hey. What? Aren't you forgetting- aren't, aren't you forgetting something? Like what? Like, you're supposed to be at work today? What? You've slept in. I know. My alarm hasn't gone off yet. Check the time. Okay. I've slept in. Fuck. Fuck. It's an inevitable getting up, that is. I feel like my head is about to explode. Fuck this, fuck that, fuck everything. just want to stay in bed. God, I need to get dressed. Could I just not dress up for work? Yesterday I accidentally tore a sock while putting it on. We even invented clothing. Could I, could I, just not. Then I have to brush my teeth. Then I need to buy toothpaste that doesn't taste like ass. And then I need to eat. Uh, just coffee, and then I need to work and feel like I'm stuck in a little box I should go instead. Uh, I would really love to avoid everyone asking why I'm late, but first I need to get the fuck up. You use, well, why is the cat? Come on. Up, 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 up. Actually terrifying. Oh no. Well, that was a disaster. The only way this could have been worse is if I had eaten a lemon before. I think I keep postponing the electric toothbrush deliberately by now. Just me or my hands heavier or something. Note to self, buy a better toothbrush. Yep, because that'll keep my problems away. Ugh. Who puts pineapple on a piece of fast food? That'll keep me healthy. Like, who does this to themselves? This is so s stale. Duh. Me, obviously. Okay.
Oh god. Oh god. <laughs> no, this is not working. I can't. I just can't. I'm late anyway. Everyone's going to love the new fake excuses. It'd be easier to quit and find a new job. Why even, why even work if nothing matters? I'm just gonna love the excuses. Everything looks fucked up. Am I going insane? Have I actually just snapped? Is this the black pit of despair people talk about? I can't just... I can't. Nope. I, I don't know. I think I need to talk to Mick. What are you doing? I think I forgot to set the alarm. I have slept in again. Fuck. I'm calling in sick today. I think I forgot to set the alarm. Is everything okay? It's fine. You're putting a dot at the end of your sentences. What's that supposed to mean? That means you're not fine. Okay. okay, oops. Tell me what's up. I'm fine. Stop worrying about it. Dude, I hate myself. Like, really, really hate myself. I hate everything. Yo, what? Type in the words to defeat the... How do you... What? Cockroach? Sorry, those. <sighs> Panicking a little bit. I couldn't tell if it was actually if the words were actually being inputted. This is surreal, yep. I need to stop doing this to myself. Yep. I guess there's some solutions to this. Get some help. And to take back control of that time. Oh. So, I came back in here and I was just hitting stuff to try and get to the ending quick. And I noticed that the color was different from last time. And also, I realized that... There's changes with the heads that I don't know what they're for, what they mean. I'm losing it. Oh god, that's... Wow, okay, the monster's way different. I tried to put in words that weren't quite helpful, but it doesn't seem like anything happens. I like I waited to see if there like a bad end is gonna happen and I put in the words like greed, war, and like things that weren't quite that helpful. And colors changed but it doesn't hurt you. Here we have Get Help. Explore the life of a teenager struggling with the everyday tasks of society. Attempt to improve their mental state day by day. Talk to people and complete homework. Learn their story through these tasks. Try to understand what they're going through. You must go through each day completing either a phone or door conversation while trying to mostly get positive responses to the questions that are shown. Should you fail this, then you will end up repeating days. However, if you succeed, you will, you will advance to the next segment of the story. You'll also need to complete a homework assignment each day revealing more about the character in the story and their mental state. Succeed ten times fully understand the character and what they're going through. Physics assignment. 
I live in a nightmare in which I am my own worst enemy. Each day I fear to leave my room and inflict myself upon society a constant weight maintains the dull insistence to return to bed despite the lack of sleep it brings part of me knows I must keep on top of college work and tell people how I feel but these are impossible tasks so I remain here in limbo between guilt and apathy utterly lonely except for a thousand unheard voices another day passes yet nothing changes Oh, there it is. Uh, hi, how are you? Not bad. How are you finding homework? I need an extension. I raced through mine last night. Do you want any help with yours? Uh, yeah. Why can't I do this? I try to type, but I feel a steady weight that begins behind my eyes and grips my whole head. Everyone else finds this so easy. My friends say that they completed it in a night. Why can't I? Why can't I do anything right? I can't think with this pressure around my head. I can't see the letters as they dance across the screen, taunting me. I just want to sleep, fly away where I'm not letting everyone down and everything doesn't look so dark. How are you? Uh... I miss hearing you play the guitar. Why have you stopped? can't find I enjoy it lately. You used to be so outgoing, but I barely see you leave the house anymore. I haven't been feeling well. It's sunny outside today. I watch from my window as my neighbor returns home from work, calling hello to my dad as she gets out of her car. She's smiling, seeming excited to be home. I wish I felt that happy. Seems like my room is filled with fog despite the bright sunshine outside, making everything hard to see. I can't bring myself to go out. My wardrobe seems too far away, my rucksack too heavy, my body too clumsy to move. Instead, I stand at the window, staring at the world filled with bustling cheerful people wishing but being too terrified to join them I've been mashing Z and now I'm just like I'm just gonna hit every single key on my keyboard <laughs> Morning, how are you today? I want to tell you something. You're running late, are you coming down for breakfast? I'm not hungry. Have you done your homework? I could do with some help. I know I need to get going. I need to get dressed. Face the day. Eat breakfast, all that normal stuff, but all seems so impossible right now. 
There's a pit in my stomach that seems both empty and full at the same time, crying out for me to return to bed, to stay. So I stay staring at the wall, trying hard not to think too much. Thinking too much is dangerous on days like this. I ignore my mom as she calls up the, st up the stairs again, telling me to get ready for college. She doesn't understand. No one understands. How's it going? Let's meet up. What would you like to do? God damn it. I like to chat about how I've been feeling. Okay, shall we get some food? Yeah. yeah. Yes. God damn it. Yeah, I could do with something to eat. I'm meant to go and meet my friend in an hour. I'm meant to be getting dressed right now. I'm meant to be excited to see my friend. Instead, I sit in here feeling numb, trying to muster the energy to move. What is wrong with me? I bet my friend doesn't really want to see me anyway. Why would they? I bet they have loads of other people they would rather meet with. People who are better friends than me. I don't want to hold them back. I'm a burden to them. No, I'm not going. I'm staying right here where I can't bother anyone. Hello, are you all right? How was college? I'm struggling with work. Do you want me to take a look? Uh, yes. I think what would be a nice touch to this if you had the words where you can kind of, you can see them and you can type out the words and it'd make it a lot easier and it it'd give a better feeling better than kind of mashing at the keys or one key I try again to do some work I thought I did an okay job yesterday, but reading over it today shows me that what I have written is terrible, childish, and boring. I feel worthless and stupid. I delete the whole document and bury my head in my pillow, the voices of my teacher trickling through my head, telling me that I'm never going to pass, never going to amount to anything. A part of me wants to cry, but a bigger part of me can't seem to find the energy to care. How are you feeling lately? I need help. I want you to know that you can talk to me what's wrong. I'm hearing voices. Why haven't why haven't you been to see your friends? Uh I don't feel up to it. Mom came up to my room earlier 
and hovered outside it for ages. I heard Dad speak to her in a low voice, feeling, telling her about what I had said. They both sounded upset. I think Mom even cried a bit. I feel a terrible guilt. I bet they wish that they had a regular teenager who was fun and everyone liked. I wish I was that person too. I wish they could look at me with pride instead of the ever-present worry. I'm just not good enough. Every day I try, but some days it's like walking through mud. Every step just becomes heavier as you sink further and further down into the muck. I wish they understood how hard it is to try. How are you? Is everything all right at college today? Oh, uh, got it. You seem really distracted all day. What's on your mind? You're right. I should take some time off. My friend came to see me after college today. They said that they had noticed me being spaced out during the lesson. I had I hadn't had a good day. My head felt crushed in a vice, forever on the verge of tears. My throat tight and constricted. I barely understood what the teacher had been saying, let alone the concept of the work. I didn't say much while my friend spoke to me, feeling the familiar guilt swirl in my stomach. I'm an awful friend. I wanted to tell them that. It was nothing they had done. It was just that my world today had seemed colorless, like an old black and white movie. I wanted to tell them that I had no idea how I was going to pass this class. Instead, I made some generic excuse, keen to get out of my room so I could be alone. Keen to get them out of my room so I could be alone. They paused on the way out and told me I could ring them anytime. I can't read the rest of what this is. I need to tell you something. I'd like to. Would you like to do something as family? I spoke to my parents today. Not about anything big or scary, just about music and stuff. They seemed so overjoyed that I was initiating conversation that it made me feel a little sick and familiar, and a familiar nasty thought and accusation started running through my head. But I stayed there with them even if I felt quiet after a while. When they left for bed, mom hugged me and told me she was proud of me. You can tell us how you feel. Perhaps you should see a doctor. You can try. Mom, Dad, and I had a long conversation today. I told them that I was scared of my own thoughts. That life sometimes seemed too hard. I tried to convey how difficult it is to describe how I felt. 
to describe how I felt, the apathy, the guilt, the desperate sadness. They listened without interrupting, letting me speak after what felt like hours. I admitted that I didn't think I could do this on my own anymore and that I needed some help. They reassured me that they would do all they could to help and that I should ring the GP as soon as possible. The thought scared me and the pressure in my head remained. My hand hovers over the call button, just one click, that's all I need to do. My head feels foggy again, voices that I can't make out whispering, arguing. I just want this nightmare to get better. I want to complete my college work, I want to see my friends, but what if the doctor doesn't believe me? Am I just wasting their time? Like, like I waste everyone else's? Maybe I'm... Maybe I'll just go back to sleep for a bit, try again later. I wrench myself out of the mud and hit the dial button. Uh, I can... Can I... Can, can I book an appointment? Please be aware that Unfamiliar deals with serious topics that may not be appropriate appropriate for everyone. Unfamiliar is a visual novel click-through game that attempts to show the effects of Alzheimer's on a family. Tackling such a serious theme was a new and challenging experience for our entire team. While we had fun working together on this project, we tried to always keep in mind the solemn nature of the game. We hope we're able to present these topics in a way that can shed some light on the seriousness of Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia. And included on the game page are... Uh, links for donation to Alzheimer's research and care programs. You wake up, a strong arm drapes across you from the other side of the bed. The bedroom is barely lit, with the winter sunrise scarcely noticeable outside. Shopping list from yesterday, it reads milk, butter, potatoes, cheddar cheese, thyme, ham, rolls, green beans, mushroom soup, apple, sugar. An old black and white photo of your wedding to George, seeing it every morning makes you feel young again. Your daughter Sarah with her cat boots, you think you should probably get a more recent one with her husband and her daughter. A painting of your house, your son Charles made for you back in high school. He was always good at everything he did. Your children insisted you get one of these new high-tech cell phones, but you find them unnecessary. At least George has been able to teach you a bit. He's always been much more hip than you. George's favorite album, The Temptations' Greatest Hits. He's very proud of his vast collection of vinyl records. Your husband, George. You've shared this bed for over 40 years, yet waking up with him every morning still feels like a fairy tale. You've been waking up earlier than usual, which is strange having been set in your ways for so long. You quietly roll to the side of the bed away from your husband, trying not to disturb him. You learn early in your marriage that it's best to let him sleep. Once out of bed, you notice just how cold it is in the room. You fumble in the dim light to find your robe. It isn't on the hanger where you usually leave it. Where could, have it, gone? Where could it have gone, you think? After a few more minutes of looking, you abandon the search and head to your closet, trying to find something to slip into. You're glad you're up so early. Now you have a chance to start on some of the long Christmas Eve dishes without the distractions of your company. You head to the kitchen and begin preparing the... Damn. You pull the ham from the freezer and begin to run some water to thaw it in. I don't even like ham. <laughs> Despite forgetting the thyme in, in the potatoes... Grotten, dinner is perfect. Your husband spent the whole day at the piano, filling the house with Christmas tunes. Your son Charles ran some errands while your daughter Sarah and her husband Arthur entertained their granddaughter Abigail, even letting her turn take a turn mashing the potatoes. Old picture of the RV you and George called home for a year. 
His music career was taking off and you travel the country with him. You wonder what life would have been like if you never had kids. Family portrait when Sarah and Charles were young. Keep waiting for Sarah and Arthur to give you a photo of their family to hang here. When Abigail was a baby, you bought her a stuffed elephant and it's, and it's since been her favorite toy. Last Christmas, she bought you one so, one so hers would have a friend to play with when she visits. Your daughter, Sarah, she inherited George's love of music and now teaches piano. Your son, Charles, he seems to be working all the time and you're thankful whenever you get to see him. Sarah's husband, Arthur, they've been married almost 10 years. Your granddaughter, Abigail, she reminds you so much of Sarah. Halfway through the meal, the conversation slows and the tone seems to shift. Your children exchange a few glances and excuse themselves before dessert. Their raised voices down the hall are indiscernible, but their tone suggests a heated debate. You think you're, you hear your name pop up, but you decide to distract your granddaughter with a story. I just realized I forgot to click. Is that, is that Papa in the middle? Traveled in the RV. Abigail seems to doze off. You can't blame her. She ate almost as much as George. Later that night, you share some wine and stories with the adults. Your children are back to laughing and smiling, but you catch them a few times, giving you concerned looks. You ignore them because tonight you just want to celebrate. Charles's graduation photo, you know ever since he was a child that he'd be successful in anything he did. George fills your stocking with your favorite treats every Christmas Eve. He used to get... Used to go cut your own tree every year, but you bought a fake one a few years ago after George nearly took his foot off. Thankfully, George is tall enough to place the star at the top. George was never the best dancer, but he always put his heart into it. George requests a dance and asks you to choose the music. It's the only one I know. <laughs> you put the song on and have a wonderful night dancing with George. The next morning, you venture from your room to meet the family for presents. Despite waking up at 6 a.m., you're the last one in the living room. Abigail beams when you enter. It's clear she was made to wait for you. You barely have time to grab some coffee and pick through your stocking before she's ripped open all but her last gift. When you finally sit down, Abigail hands you a present matching the one she carries. Mom made me wait to open mine with you, she says begrudgingly. You snicker at her impatience and slowly unwrap the small box. It's from all of us, Sarah says. We think it will help. You look down at the unwrapped gift. It's a leather-bound journal with a fancy floral design on the cover. It's beautiful, but you're not able to hide your lack of enthusiasm. Normally, you'd love such a thoughtful present. You know they're just trying to help, but you feel a bit hurt. Abigail loves drawing. You're thankful she at least enjoyed the gift. When you and George bought this house, a chimney was always one of the things you both knew you had, you had to have. Even though they've grown, your kids still love hosting a family snowball fight. Abigail's parents explain to her how she can use it to draw or write stories or make lists of things she doesn't forget. So she doesn't forget. You can't help but feel slightly betrayed. You sit in silence and finally look up to your family. You think you see a tear forming in your husband's eyes. Thank them. You know they're right. Maybe you'll start writing in it today. You wake up, a strong arm draped across you from the other side of bed. Your bedroom is brighter than you're used to. Did you oversleep? You check the clock, 8-12. Your journal your family got for you last Christmas. You've grown to treasure it, using it to record all sorts of stories from your past, as well as keeping track of daily activities. You've started playing memory games. Some days you do much better than others. You're thankful to have someone like him. You're not sure what you'd do without him. George's albums. He's been adding to his collection a lot lately. Your daughter Sarah with her cat Mitten socks. An old black and white photo of your wedding to George. You look and feel less and less like the woman in the photo every day. 
painting of your house. It looks so much nicer in the painting. Sarah will be here with her family in less than an hour. You scramble out of bed, urging George to do the same. You can't blame him for sleeping in. You've always been his alarm clock. Years of working late nights seem to have permanently changed his biological clock. In the closet, you find a light dress, perfect for the mild autumn weather. You finish getting dressed, but George is still propped up in bed. You snap at him to get, start getting ready. George pauses and slowly says, I'm not going with you today. You look at him, confused. What do you mean? It's the last week before Abigail starts school. You and George had always taken the kids to the zoo the last week of summer break. It was a tradition for Sarah and Charles when they were young, and you had started to back started it back up with Abigail. I'm going to the doctor later, he replied softly. We discussed this. No, that can't be right. If he was going to the doctor, you'd be going with him. You start to protest, but he leans over and grabs your leather journal. Here, read this, he says as he opens to the last entry. In your clear handwriting, an entry from two days ago reads, George insists he'll be fine. He can be so su stubborn sometimes. The doctors don't believe it's anything serious, but I want to go with him anyway. George claims it's more important for me to spend time with the family. I've agreed to go to the zoo as long as he calls me from from the doctor. Suddenly, the entire conversation from the other night rushes back in. How could you have forgotten that? Your face starts turning red with embarrassment. You set the journal down and turn to, turn to George, who had risen from the bed. He holds you and says it's okay. We all forget things sometimes. Me too, he replies. It will be okay. I'm here for you. The zoo is much less crowded than you expected. It's a welcome sight, as finding free sitting areas is much easier. You aren't as young as you were, and you always feel guilty making the rest of the family wait on you. At least when George was here, you could sit with him and let the rest go off on their own. Today, it feels like your baggage, like they're babysitting you. Near the elephants, you insist that the others can go as they please. You can catch up with them later. You find a nice spot in the shade where you can people watch. He loves seeing all the young couples with their children, minding, reminding you of the countless times you and George had brought Sarah and Charles here. Sometimes you wish you were an elephant. They never forget. The zoo has changed a lot since you first started coming here, but you always feel nostalgic seeing young families here. Abigail has grown so much. A wonderful husband. You're so lucky Sarah found someone so special. Being at the zoo with Sarah brings back so many memories, some more hazy than others. Sarah approaches and sits next to you on the bench. Where did the others go? The others go, you ask her, not seeing them nearby. They're headed to see the penguins. You didn't want to join them, you ask? Penguins had always been Sarah's favorite. No, she says. They wanted me to stay with you. You begin telling Sarah a story about one of the times you brought her here when she was little. You brought her a you bought her a balloon from a cart vendor, but George is not around her her wrist was too loose. Somewhere near the zebra exhibit, it had come completely undone and floated away into the sky. The only thing that could get her to stop crying was her favorite ice cream. You pause for a second, trying to remember the flavor. You had told the story countless times to family and friends, probably even to Sarah before. This is... this time you can't think of the flavor. You look off into the distance, knowing the answer is on the tip of your tongue. You contemplate calling George, he'll remember, but as you pull out your phone, you realize he's at the doctor's by now. Lost in your thoughts of ice cream in the past, you see Sarah and Arthur approaching. Hope she wasn't too much trouble. She, We thought she could help you, could keep you company while we went to see the penguins, Sarah says. You pause and look next to you. Abigail is sitting cross-legged legged on the bench, watching the elephants intently. You glance back to Sarah, confused, begin to panic. Your mind starts racing with questions. Had you been so lost in thought that Abigail had switched places without you noticing? Surely you hadn't been daydreaming that long. Had it been Abigail here with you the whole time? They do look alike, but surely you can tell your daughter and granddaughter apart. You take a few deep breaths and force a smile Smile to Abigail. She was fine, you reply. I was just telling her about the time you lost your balloon. Sarah laughs. Ah, uh, yes, you love that story. Thank God for ice cream or... I still may be crying to this day. How about we grab some on the way home? You still can't remember the flavor. You'll have to ask George when he calls later. Out in the parking lot, your phone starts ringing. You step away from the others to answer. On the other end, George says they're done with their tests, and he's waiting for the results. Yes, how the zoo was. Elephants. You tell him about the new baby elephant and how excited Abigail was to see it. You forget to ask him about the ice cream flavor.
He always loved puzzles. He and George had done hundreds of them over the years. This one was different, though. You can't focus at all with so many questions racing through your mind. You know George will open up when he's ready, but you're worried. His call at the ice cream shop had been vague, but you could hear the defeat in his voice. We'll talk about it tonight, he had said. The stuffed toy Abigail bought for you. Doing puzzles and listening to the radio with George is usually one of your favorite ac activities. You started setting an alarm when you work on your puzzles after you and George caught yourself staying up until 2 a.m. A puzzle of the Earth and the Moon. You've been working on it with George the past few nights. You've never seen George so hurt. You stare blankly at the half-finished puzzle. After what feels like an eternity, George looks up at you. You think it's from all the nights playing at the bars, being around all that smoke and stuff. You freeze, refusing to look at him. Fighting back tears, he manages to add, They said I have six months. Cry with George. Your whole body goes into shock. You've always associated the smell of smoke with your boyfriend, even when you couldn't make it out to watch him perform. At least you got to smell him when he stumbled into bed late at night. Tonight, though, he insisted you make it out to his show. Most of your friends preferred the disco, but watching your boyfriend's fingers dancing across the ivories was magical. Halfway through his normal list of songs, with plenty of crowd requests thrown in for good measure, he begins speaking into his old microphone. He calls you over to his piano and motions for you to sit next to him on the bench. He begins playing a song he wrote for you. It's the most beautiful thing you've ever heard, a perfect blend of of serious and cheesy. After hitting the last note, he rises from the bench and slowly starts dropping to one knee. Before you can say anything, you leap off the bench and tackle him, rolling on the ground. Between the kissing and grabbing, you blurt out yes, yes, yes amid the cheers and hollers of the crowd. Your boyfriend George, rather, your, fian your fiancé George. A couple of regulars to the bar, they love watching George almost as much as you. George had played on many pianos in his life, but the old creaky one at the piano bar was always his favorite. Finally, you let George get back to his piano and you return to your table beaming with happiness. Waves of friends and strangers come up to you con congratulating you. One stranger in a nurse's outfit approaches you. Your family's here, she says. You give her a puzzled look. Sarah and Abigail are standing behind her. This is no place for a young child, you think to yourself. Hi, Mom. I'm sorry Arthur couldn't make it. He has some work thing. Arthur. The name sounds familiar, but you aren't sure who he is. It must be one of George's friends. How are you feeling, Sarah asks. Amazing. George and I just got got engaged. Sarah's face slowly drops. Papa died, blurts out Abigail. Sarah quickly cuts her off. Abigail, why don't you get your ballet shoes on and show Nana what you've been practicing? Sarah turns back to you. Think you can tell me about that night? Sarah's head drops, thinking of the words to say. I'm sure he'll be fun. He'll be around soon. Ballet was always your favorite activity as a kid, even if you were never the best. You loved dressing up and dancing, the feeling of being lighter than air. Recitals made you nauseous, though. People watching you always made you feel strange, and you were always nervous about messing up. Your group is the first to perform, and once on stage, you instantly feel free. You forget the crowd and do the routine you've practiced for hundreds of hours. As you hold your final pose, you beam with pride while the crowd cheers. You return back to your seat and watch the next group begin their performance. You can't help but feel a little jealous. The older girls are much more beautiful than you. You hope to be as pretty as them one day. Your neighbors watching their daughter. They seem so much older than you remember. A strange recording a stranger recording his daughter. You don't know any of them since they practice a different day than you, but one of the girls looks very familiar. You watch her the entire time trying to figure out if you've seen her at school or around the neighborhood. When they finish, the familiar girl walks over and sits next to you. Still unable to recognize her, you ask, Do you go to my school? 
The woman next to the young girl overhears this and leads in towards her. It's okay, Abigail. Remember, we had talked about this happening. Abigail, frustrated, looks back up at you. You're my Nana. Admit it's the truth. Ignore her. Lash out at the girl for playing. It's the truth. It doesn't make sense to you, but somehow the girl is right. You watch the rest of the performances in silence. A doctor enters the room. George sits on a chair next to your bed, holding your hand. You've known something's wrong for a while, but some part of you just hoped it was a symptom of getting older. The misplaced items, the changes in mood, the missing words, these were normal for people your age, right? George has been patient with you for the most part, but he had finally convinced you to get checked, just in case he had said. The doctor, sh short on small talk, asked to speak to George outside. That can't be a good sign, you think. After what feels like ages, they return to your bedside, George's face impossible to read. The doctor calmly and coolly says, you're exhibiting signs of early stages of Alzheimer's. He continues on with a long explanation of the varying tests they still want to perform. Despite his reassurance, all you can do is repeat the first sentence over and over in your head. I've discussed with your husband some of the ways he can go about making life easier for you. We think a journal might keep help you keep track of your thoughts. You're lucky to have someone like him. George reaches down and grabs your hand again, squeezing tighter than before. Various certifications and diplomas. Brains are such tricky things. We use them constantly, yet we understand so little about them. Various files and records. You wonder how many other people are going to have their wor world shattered in this room today. You want to hate him. This man just completely flipped your life upside down, but you know he's just doing his job and he's here to help. George is silent. He's trying to be strong for you, but you can tell he's struggling. Suddenly you wake up. What a horrible dream. You roll over to hold George, but he's not there. He must be up already tending the garden. You reach over and grab a leather-bound journal. You aren't sure why, but you're drawn to it. You flip to the last page and begin writing about a trip you took to England when you were a girl. You wake up in a much softer bed than you're used to. To the cheerful songs of birds outside, despite the relaxing atmosphere, you're miserable. You're in a strange bed in a strange room. Your thoughts are spinning but in slow motion. You try searching your brain for anything, any, mem any memories at all. Ruby. Your name is Ruby. A beautiful family portrait. You wonder if you know them. A painting of a house. If you ever buy a home, you hope it looks like that one. A strange alarm clock. A leather-bound journal. It's worn but not old. The pictures on the wall seem familiar, as if you'd seen them on TV in the past. Suddenly a rush of deja vu comes across you. You've been here before, perhaps many times. Your whole life feels like it's just on the tip of your tongue, but you're unable to find the answer. A short while later, two strangers, a man and woman, enter the room. Hi, Mom, one of them says. I don't... I don't have any children, you manage to blurt out. The words are forced, as if speaking has become a chore. You're not even sure if you believe what you said, but you can't remember having any children. You must look visibly upset because the woman reaches for your hand, trying to comfort you. The man walks around the bed and picks up a journal on the nightstand. Would you like to hear some stories about a woman we know? It's our favorite, he says. I guess, you mumble. For the next few hours, the man and woman take turns sharing the, the entries from the journal. Some of them are happy and others sad. Some seem long ago and others feel recent. The stories are familiar as if you had lived them in a past life. With each story told, you feel a little more relaxed. As if life is slowly making sense. The final story they tell is about a son and daughter who read stories of their family to their dying mother. Just as the final story ends, you smile up at the strangers. I'd sure love to have a family like that someday, you manage to say. The strangers smile, looking at the last line of the book that you had just unknown unknowingly read. Love you, Mom. We'll see you next week. Love you, too. You watch them walk out and hope you'll see them again.
And here we have our last game. I'm hoping that this one's lighthearted. It sounds like it is, but I'm not entirely sure. So I'm hoping it is just because I want something to lighten up our moods after everything. Um, this is a text-based game where you navigate the tricky headspace of a teenager who's going to see a movie with his friend. There's no underlying intent to watching this movie. You're just a cinephile who appreciates modern classics. Who cares if it's pr if it is prominently features a gay romance? Who cares if it prom? Okay, I read that sentence completely wrong. Fumbled it so bad. Click through several dialogue options to determine how the protagonist proceeds processes what's around him. Certain events during the story will trigger many game sequences that will affect the protagonist's perspective. And there are three different endings. Holy shit, this place is empty. Ugh, you're right. I guess nobody's clamoring to see this a month after it's out, huh? But it's an Oscar nominee. Nom nom nom. It's Oscar nominated and everything. Dallas divided. Divide will be the talk of film studies for years. People don't want to see this. See what? Cowboys and assless traps spread across a 30 foot screen? I think your priorities are a little different from the aver average viewer, bro. Oh, yeah? Then why'd you come with me? I'm gonna throw melt studs at the screen to see if they stick, duh. Holy shit. Wait. Holy shit, you see this? Uh, but what? The armrest goes up. Clave flips the armrest up and down a few times to show it off. Are you trying to cuddle or something? I was mostly hoping for a handy, actually. No homo. <laughs> you keep saying that and I'll start to suspect something. Oh yeah, bro. I've been pining for you all this time. You haven't noticed? Two star-crossed bros, one madly in love with the other. Gah, shut up. The letters left unsent, the whispers left unwhispered. The love yet unconfessed. Until a gallant romantic proposal that I jerk you off in an empty movie theater? Exactly. No homo. Then keep your pants on for now, the movie's starting. The movie's getting tense. The main character, Buck, has been grappling with something all morning after accidentally catching his martial friend, Randall, bathing in a nearby spring. Oh no. His booty... is beautiful. On screen, Buck sits bow-legged on a stool. He's dragged... a stool he's dragged around the side of the house. Randall's there, up on his horse, listening to Buck. Do you ever dream, Randall? What do you mean? I do. I dream every night. I... A gunshot, a gunshot rings over the mountaintops, sending a cloud of birds out of the trees and up, up out of frame. Before Buck can finish, Randall's kicked his horse into a gallop and he disappears in, in a cloud of dust. Ah, oh, hell, forget it. Oh shit, we're sharing an armrest. His arm is touching my arm. Out of the corner of your eye, Clay seems transfixed by the movie. You guess he's counting how long the milk dud he threw will stay stuck to the screen. I don't even know if he's noticed. Should I move it? Hit the space bar at the right moment to choose what you what you want to do. What? I'm not going to... Uh, uh. You gently slide your hand off the armrest over the course of a minute. His eyes and yours stay staring at the screen. I didn't know what I was doing! I wasn't... I wasn't ready. I got nervous. It's about halfway through the movie now. Randall has conscripted Buck for help returning a herd of Russell cattle back to their owners. Resting at a makeshift campsite the third night out, Buck sees Randall pulling off his jeans before redonning his chaps. Underneath, he isn't wearing underwear. <gasps> oh, oh my god! There's an extended close-up on Randall's ass, partially lit by flinting orange firelight. Clay stifles a giggle. Oh my god, dude, what is happening? That's a... Uh, uh, this is definitely an ass. What the hell do I say about this? Please, brain. Let me say something smart. What? Click the option you want to say. Hurry or Clay will think you're a dork. 
I uh, where? How do I? Uh, uh, I'm cracking up. <laughs> oh wow, that that's a pretty nice butt, honestly. Does Clay's butt look like this? Oh my god. Right? Can't believe how much this actor had to work out for his role. That thing is chiseled. Uh, no homo. Yeah, right, bro, sure. Clay snickers and winks at you. Hey, your secret's safe with me. Love is love. Shut up, dude. Shut up! We're near the end of the movie now. Buck and Randall slept together two nights before they got back to town, and they aren't sure what to say now, they're, now that they're home. They're sitting at Buck's kitchen table while, while his family is out at the market. Buck looks like he's about to cry. Buck, no one can know about this. I, we, made a mistake. You can't tell me this, this was a mistake. Something happened out there with you and me. You can't say it doesn't mean anything. We have homes, Buck. Families. There ain't room for this type of... Debauchery. Maybe out there in the divide. But not here. I love you, Randall. There or here, no matter where we are. Where, where we are. Randall puts his hat on and turns away, standing at the edge of the doorway. What? This is just Brokeback Mountain. You know I can't say it, Buck. As the music swells, Randall steps out. Buck gets up to follow him. You take a moment to peek over at Clay. He's leaned forward, eyes locked toward the screen, supporting a quivering frown. God. Is he? Kind of cute. Should probably pay attention to the movie, but... Mash the, the left or right arrows to scoot your gaze around. I've... Uh... What if I... I don't know what you want me to look at, I'm just gonna stare at this. I don't know what you want from me! You look back up at the movie. Buck follows Randall out the door and catches up to him on the dirt path that leads towards town. Randall! Randall! I can't remember. <laughs> Just gonna keep switching it up, it's okay. It's a dice roll. Who gets to be the sexier southern cowboy? Go up. Are all cowboys southern? I don't think so. Randall stops and turns around. Tears are rolling down his face. God damn it, Buck. Ah, I don't know how to quit you. Buck approaches him slowly and pulls him into a kiss. Randall kisses him back. You don't have to. You look down for a moment to wipe your eyes. When you look back up, the credits have already started. You both walk out of the movie theater a little daze as the credits roll. So, what'd you think of the movie? It was great. The lighting, the cinematography, that ass. Whew. The acting. Holy shit, right? Right? It was, like, really good. Wow, I honestly expected us to kind of just rip rip on it for a few hours. Exactly, the story was just, like, too good. And then, but, oh my god. Oh yeah, dude, I could tell how much you were into it. Don't think I didn't catch you tearing up. His eyes narrow as he smiles, and you instinctively wipe a tear off your cheek. You... How couldn't you cry about a movie like that? They fell in love despite all the obstacles. They're taking a chance for each other. God, I want love like that. Like, exactly like that. Ass and all. Oh, fuck. Clay scratches the back of his head and tucks his hands into his pockets. So, uh, you ready to head home? Uh, maybe you go on ahead. I gotta take a walk around the block or something first. Reflection ending. It's probably boring. Probably just too boring or something. Who'd unironi unironically go and see a gay cowboy romance? <laughs> Not me. Uh, me, of course. Who doesn't want to see chiseled butts un unrestrained from ass chaps? No homo. That's absolutely a yes homo. Light it up, bro. I can't make a butt joke without you getting weird. Holy shit. Wait, holy shit, you see this? You go to pull your hand away, but nearly knock over your popcorn in the process. Clay turns his head towards you, one brow arched. 
Christ, so you all right, bro? Something bite you? Duh, no, it's nothing. I'm all good. Loving the movie? No homo. Okay. Clay turns back to the mo to watch the movie, then sighs. Damn, the milk dud fell off the guy's face when I wasn't looking. It's about halfway through the movie now. Randall has conscripted Buck for help. Okay. Oh, wait. For help returning a herd of rustled cattle back to their owners. Resting on a makeshift campsite the third night out, Buck sees Randall pulling off his jeans before. Oh. I don't know why I don't remember that. Pa um, uh, what panic? Look at the lighting! Look at the lighting! <laughs> No, wait. This is totally important. I learned this by watching Drive. Bullshit, dude. I'm serious. Did you see how the top of the left cheek is blue, but the bottom of the right is orange? Orange and blue is super important in movies because, uh... It evokes a sunset. Uh... It draws the eye. I don't know. It draws the eye across the screen from one side to the other. I'm not kidding. It works great here. I think a dude's chiseled ass is enough to draw your eye across the screen, bro. Har har, shut up, dude. I'm talking about cinematography, look at those colors. The way it's just, oh. Beautiful. You elbow him in the side and smile at him, he smiles back. What if I just don't look at the movie? You blush and stare down at the floor between Clay and the screen. You're not sure how the movie ends, and you don't know if Clay sees you looking away. After what seems like an eternity, the credits finally start. You both walk out the movie theater a little dazed. Haha, <laughs> it was wild, dude! Clay chuckles, I totally didn't just stare at the wall for the entirety of the rest of the movie. Clay chuckles half-heartedly, but his shoulders droop a bit. He cracks a little smile. Yeah, man, totally real hilarious stuff. You nod a little- uh, You nod a little too quickly. Totally, man. Totally. How do you expect a guy to sit through that much bear man ass and not laugh about it, huh? <laughs> definitely wasn't admiring it. But, yeah, exactly. There's a few seconds where neither of you say anything. Both of you look down at the other's shoes. Anyway, man, you ready to head home? Yeah, sure. Let's get out of here. I am in denial. I don't like man ass. Absolutely not. No, that's silly. He doesn't even care. Plus, it's kind of nice to have my hand to his, close to his. You flint your eyes back towards the screen and keep watching the movie. For a moment, you think he glances at you. Uh, uh, what do I- the lighting. It evokes a sunset. It reminds a view of a sunrise or sunset. It's about lo about longing or the horizon or something. The mooning joke is far too easy for me to make here. Maybe there's a vertical horizon kind of kind of thing on screen that you're longing for. Was that a good joke? Was that anything? Like, the dude's ass crack is a vertical horizon? <laughs> yeah. I'll give you points for effort, but we can workshop it later. Thanks for understanding, but like, legit, it's pretty impressive, you know that. Yeah, you could- you could say I'm, uh... Ass connoisseur. Damn, bro, you look good in this lighting. Your side profile? Immaculate. I don't even want to look at the screen. <laughs> Why do I need to look at cowboy man ass when I could just look at your beautiful face? You're not even sure how the movie ends. You're too busy. You're looking at the way the light flickers on his face, the way his hands seem to tense up. You're looking at his eyes, looking at the screen, and how a single line of water builds up at the bottom of one lid. He wipes it away, glances at you, blushes, looks back at the movie. D shut up, dude. You're both smiling until the music fades. 
It was, uh... I have no fucking clue. <laughs> Something tells me you weren't really paying that much attention to the movie. Yeah... I, uh... I guess I had something else on my mind. Yeah, too busy turning up more salient film crit to actually watch. Clay chuckles, his eyes glitter in the sunlight, and you feel yourself blush. You can't help but laugh, too. Oh my god, he's beautiful. Yeah, man, you got me. Boy, and... <laughs> well, this was cute. Um... This was also a nice... A nice way to end things after... The other games. If you stayed with me up until this point, I thank you. I'm gonna be honest, when when we first entered the theater and Clay started talking about the, the, the little... the little Hindi... All I could think about was Valhalla, and I felt the exhaustion hit me again. The... I'm not sure if this is gonna... I'm pretty sure this is gonna come out before I post the ending of Valhalla. Or... Sort of the ending of Valhalla. <laughs> Just Dreaming Chan and Dorothy together... <sighs> the exhaustion... <laughs> Yeah, uh, I hope you guys have a good day and a good night. Whether it means anything, I love you all, and I really do hope to see you again. Catch you later.